let's take a minute and do a little review of some of the synthesis that we've seen before of ketones and aldehydes. So how do we make these things? Well, back in chapter 10, we talked about oxidation of alcohols to aldehydes and to ketones. So what we saw is that we could take a primary alcohol and we, we could use PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate. So that's what PCC is, but I'm happy with you just calling that PCC. Um, and that takes primary alcohols and oxidizes them to aldehydes. So this is capable of being further oxidized in theory because it has an H that could be replaced with an oxygen. That would make it more oxidized. But this reaction is important to remember that it stops here. So if we want an aldehyde, this is the reagent that we need to use. Now with secondary alcohols down here below, so it's secondary, remember, because your OH has two R groups on it, we could use acidified sodium dichromate, otherwise known as the Jones reagent. PCC could oxidize this too, and it goes to a ketone. So that is not capable of being oxidized further. Okay. Um, what about ozonolysis? So this is an oxidative cleavage. So if we use ozone, we can take that and it basically cleaves this bond here. And what you'd be left with in this case is your R group, your R1 with this carbon, that's this guy here. Okay, and then an oxygen goes there and then H comes down here. And then we get another carbon and oxygen. So that part here gets split apart and that's your R2 and that's your R3. So it would give us a mixture of aldehydes and ketones. So remember, in this case, this can be oxidized further, but it stops with ozonolysis. So this stops here and we end up with our ketone. Um, and then most recently, we saw in the last chapter, Friedel Crafts acylation. So we could take an acid chloride like this molecule, that's an acid chloride functional group right here. We can add AlCl3 for our catalyst and benzene, and then we would add another ring to it. So that's the ring that we added on to this thing. But anyway, here you're taking an acid chloride, and you're turning it into, in this case, a ketone. Right? It's a benzophenone derivative. So all those reactions we've seen so far, what about hydration of alkynes? Well, that was from first semester. And if you remember, there were two reagents that could be used for that. Right? One of them was a mercury containing um, reaction mixture. And the other one was having the boron with a large R group. So that uh, the SIA2 is secondary isoamyl borane. Well, with the mercury ion and sulfuric acid, we end up getting um, a carbocation that, that causes the water to attack at this position. Right? That gives us the enol. And then through acid catalyzed ketoenol to atomerism, you get what we called before, right? That was the keto form. Um, again, that the enols, if you recall, are typically unstable. So we usually would write the keto form for this. That gives you the Markovnikov addition because the carbon here at the end with more H's gets more H's. So the rich get richer is another way of looking at that Markovnikov addition. If we want to go anti-Markovnikov, um, then we need to add the BH3 derivative for alkynes, with this, which is SIA2BH. So that puts the OH at this um, outside position, right, where we have here this interior position. It's still an enol. Remember an enol because it's a double bond next to an OH. And this is base catalyzed. So remember, it's base catalyzed because we have hydroxide here. So that second step, you're in a solution of actually of aqueous um, hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. It's the same reason why this step up here continues on because we have plenty of H3O plus in solution.
Now we've also seen hydride addition to form alcohols. So in hydride addition, again this is a, from last semester, you have H minus. If you remember, we have two sources of H minus, right? Um, LiAlH4, which we often would abbreviate as LaH, and also NaBH4. So remember, LaH is more reactive. It'll reduce aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids, amides, nitriles, whereas NaBH4 only reacts with ketones and aldehydes. So if you recall that reaction from first semester, you have your carbon with a delta plus on it. H minus comes over, grabs a hold of that carbon, and you kick off electrons up to your oxygen. That makes your alkoxide here. And then step two is just a deprotonation. And remember that that carbon has the potential to become chiral. So in this case, um, you would have formed a chiral center there. Right. The other reaction that we saw last semester was the addition of organometallic reagents. So we saw organolithium and organomagnesium. The Grignard was the one we kind of used very frequently. So if we have a Grignard, if you recall, the way we make Grignard, so important for multi-step, is that we take an alkyl halide like this. We add magnesium. So that magnesium is solid. You put little shavings of magnesium in there. Diethyl ether is your solvent. And then you would make your Grignard reagent. Now recall that this reacts like it's a free CH3 minus and an MgBr plus. It's not really, but it reacts like that. It's a strong base and it's very reactive. Well, what happens for a reaction is we see these electrons coming over, grabbing a hold of that carbon. If you recall from our previous example, that's where your delta plus is. That'll give you a minus charge up here. And in your second step, um, you would get your protonation. So here, again, to highlight, this is step number one. So in lab, you have to carry out that step separately. And then once you have formed that new carbon-carbon bond, you carry out step number two, which is just an acid workup. Now it's important when you carry out this reaction that you don't have any solvents that contain hydrogens that can be pulled off by this very strong base. So that means we, we can't really have alcohols or thiols or amines. So typically we need to make sure our glassware, if we're carrying out this reaction, has no residual water on it. So we typically you dry your glassware like the day before and you stick it in the oven and make sure that it's nice and dry. Pipettes and everything need to be dry. Now those Grignards react with all sorts of carbonyl containing compounds. So formaldehydes, aldehydes, um, ketones, we'll see acid chlorides coming up, we'll see esters coming up, and we saw ethylene oxide or epoxides back in first semester in chapter 14. Now the most common type of reaction for an aldehyde and a ketone is nucleophilic addition. So um, often these type of reactions can take place in acidic conditions or in basic conditions. So if you look down here below at this little example, here's an example of acid catalyzed nucleophilic addition of water to acetone. So if we look at this reaction down here below, you can see uh, that you have your lone pairs here on oxygen grabbing a hold of a proton, or it's an H technically from, from that. Right, so it grabs a hold of this H right here, and then we kick off some water there. What you would be left with is, and let's put our lone pairs in, is this intermediate that's resonance stabilized. That would give us this fellow with our plus charge here. And then we would have water here. So water works, or we could use an alcohol. And the important thing to point out is all we really are looking for is an oxygen that's nucleophilic. Um, and then what we form here is this tetrahedral intermediate. So we have a set of electrons here, right? And then this water comes over here. This is why, remember, it's acid. 
catalyzed, so we need to regenerate the acid. Comes over and grabs a hold of that H and restores our oxygen to a formal charge of zero here. So it turns out that this, and this is an important point, that, um, that this C H2O plus thing, that's a good leaving group. So this guy right here is a good leaving group. So the reverse re reaction is possible too. Um, so it's something that we have to look look at and we have to deal with carefully if we're carrying out a reaction like this in, uh, in lab. Now the other thing that can occur here too is that we can um, undergo reactions under more basic conditions, so stronger nucleophiles. So the first case again being um, kind of like your acidic conditions or weaker nucleophiles. Um, and the second case would be stronger nucleophiles, which usually means that you're basic. So if you take a look at your carbonyl and look at how this reaction would occur, here you have your nucleophile. So it's got a pair of electrons with it. And remember, it's going to be attracted to this delta plus of that carbon, right? Because the dipole is getting pulled towards the oxygen atom. So electron flow comes down here to that carbon. So we're moving down this direction, right? And then that set of electrons comes over down here onto the oxygen atom there, okay? Now what that gives us then is our nucleophile here attached to that, that carbon atom, so this carbon here, right? And then our oxygen with a minus charge here. Now one thing to point out to you is that we're, we're changing our hybridization from sp3 to sp2. Whenever that happens, we have to make sure that we're being very careful and looking for potential new chiral centers that have been formed. So let's look at some examples of where we might see something like that. Well, what if we add this Grignard reagent here to, um, to two butanone? Well, if we look at that molecule, we have a carbon that's sp two hybridized, and phenylmagnesium bromide means that we have a, basically a benzene here with a, a minus charge on it, and that thing can come around and grab a hold of this carbon. When it does that, electrons get pushed up here to the top. Now it can do it from the front p orbital or the back p orbital of that carbon atom. Let's look at what happens here. So if it does it from the front, then that phenyl group will be pointing out at us. Right? And that would cause the oxygen to get pushed back. But there's no reason why the reaction can't take place kind of behind the paper, right? So if it comes around behind, then that phenyl group will be out here, be on a, a, a dash, and that would push the oxygen out here in the front. Right? So this is your step number one and then in a lab all you would do is you would take this and carry out step number two which is just your acid workup. So you're going to form a mixture, in this case a mixture of enantiomers. So we get these two fellows. Also, we've also seen how hydride can add across that carbonyl. Right? We saw that in one of our previous problems. So here we could use H2O. You could also use H3O plus to do uh, your work up here. Now, one of the things we're going to look at before we get into the, the new reactions is we need to talk about the relative reactivity of aldehydes and ketones. So just to get it out there right in the beginning, I'll tell you guys that aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Okay, let's talk about why. There's two reasons. So the first reason is because of electronic effects. So let's take a look at how this influences our reactivity here. So when we talk about electronic effects, remember the structure of a ketone looks like this. And we, we know that we have a dipole getting pulled this direction. 
right? So a dipole getting pulled up. What that does is that leaves a delta plus on our carbon atom here, right? As we've seen that before. Now, an aldehyde does the same thing. It's got a carbonyl, and we have a dipole getting pulled up this direction. Now, that delta plus that forms on those carbon atoms can be bigger or smaller depending on um, electron donation from neighboring groups. Right? So if you recall, these R groups here are um, donators of electron inductively. So these guys both donate electron density in towards that carbon. Right, so that minimizes or makes that delta plus a little bit smaller. So we have a delta plus here about that. Let's just draw it about that size. Where over here, we only have one R group. So we can only do it from one side like this. So what that leaves us with then is on this carbon, it leaves us with a larger delta plus. So we get a larger delta plus here. So if it's bigger delta plus, then it pulls in nucleophiles with a, a greater force in essence, okay? Well, the other thing that matters to us is the sterics or the size, so relative size. Well. When you look at a ketone, remember nucleophiles are attacking that carbon, right? So as you go through and have your, your nucleophile, it doesn't really matter what it is, but when your nucleophile comes over and tries to react here, right, it, it might bounce off of these guys and come over, but it's gotta work its way in a little bit harder. It's a tougher approach here. Right, where on this side, if you have your nucleophile, your approach is less hindered because it only has one R group. So there's less hindrance there. So both of those factors um, give rise to um, aldehydes being more react reactive than ketones. Now, in our next section, we're gonna get into the new reactions of aldehydes and ketones.